Okay. Good. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you uh, in the room and a warm welcome to everybody who's joined us on Zoom. Uh, this is a really special day. The gods have rained and reduced the temperature for, for, for us, we shall say, uh, to make this even more special. Um, uh, I, I think it was in 2004 or five, must have been 2005, when I first came to this building, to actually to this uh, conference room with Land. Uh, when he he presented uh, the Pritchett and Pandey paper on uh, on school education in this room, I think it was one of the first seminars that Pratap had organized when he came to CPR as president. And then we did a series of seminars uh, back back then. I, I gave my first seminar on NREG that came out of that. Um, uh, I, that that was a series that Land you had I think put together with with Pratap. So um, my relationship with CPR essentially began with Lance Pritchett and Pondé presentation in this room. Um, and I guess it's like uh, Hotel California. Once you come in, you just don't leave. So I've been around here for a very, very long time. Uh, and therefore, it makes it even more special that CPR gets to kick off its 50th anniversary celebrations with Lant here to deliver the inaugural lecture. Lant has been central to many uh, significant moments in CPR. In fact, the first big expansion um, of CPR when many of our colleagues here, myself, Partho and others came to CPR, even PRS, I think, uh, all of our initial ideas got a huge fillip when you were at the google.org, uh, which gave us some funds uh, to start off uh, many bodies of work, google.org kind of disappeared into the sunset or you can search it on google.com i guess and find some version of it but we stuck on uh and uh a lot of the a lot of what cpr does today actually traces its history back to some of those early conversations at those early days and we still go back to pritchett and Pandey and the matrix that we made there and we make all kinds of matrices to keep ourselves occupied and excited so thank you very, very much, Lant, for, for, for being here and for kicking off our 50th celebrations um, on what promises to be filled with graphs and matrices, a fantastic presentation on some new work that Lant is doing. So I can assure you when CPR celebrates its 60th anniversary, we will all be here. I too will probably be about as gray as Lant is now. Um, to talk about the uh, neighbor mo mobility across the globe. Uh, today's presentation is titled Make in India and Made in India, a win-win for India's global leadership. This reflects some new work that Lant is doing on global mobility. We couldn't have a more important issue to discuss. A lot of work at CPR uh, looks at labor markets and particularly uh, some of us here were the early movers in thinking about labor movement within India, uh, internal migration, an issue that rarely gets uh, debate, but of course, uh, there is a lot of labor movement, glo global labor mobility too, that needs to be debated. Many in this room left and came right back and are determined to stay, uh, but may also move away um, if mobility patterns make things easier. So over to you, Lance, to 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 make us learn how that can happen. And a special thank you to uh, uh, Professor K. P. Krishnan, who's also had a long history of association with CPR, the early work that CPR did on public institutions that eventually came together in the form of the State Capacity Initiative uh, and, and work that is being done under there, began in conversations with KP Krishnan and a lot of his work on civil service reforms, on regulation, on, on public institution reform more broadly has shaped a lot of our thinking. KP is an honorary professor at the center uh, so uh, it again, it truly fitting to have you here uh, to mark the fifty, the first uh, discussion, uh, the first lecture for our fiftieth, and to discuss Lance's presentation. Thank you, KP, uh, for making it. And Lance, over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Let's, uh, as uh, promised, I do have some slides and figures and. Uh, the club. Uh, and um, the Make in India and Made in India, or am I going to be able to control it? Yeah, okay. So the Make in, Ma Make in India and Made in India is uh, uh, referring to the 
country's export strategy, at least campaign is make in India, but there are a lot of people made in India <laughs> in the old fashioned way. Um, and that the people made in India are an equal, could be envisioned as an equal integral part of India's economic strategy. Um, you don't have to just, you know, uh, make it in India and sell it. You can actually have Indians move abroad and directly engage in productive activities abroad. So, um, and what I want to get back to, so I'm, let's see if I can move this. Oh, um, ah, okay. So I want to start by acknowledging my long and uh, fruitful association with CPR. Uh, my original um, Flailing State paper was, drew heavily on conversations with a philosopher of the classics who somehow was working at a policy institution. <laughs> um, I worked with Sham on uh, rethinking inequality about caste and how caste had changed in the market reform era in UP. I contributed to a book of Navosha, uh, uh, Navrosas on uh, regulation. Uh, I wrote uh, Taxes, uh, Price of Civilization, or Tribute to Leviathan, and another paper with uh, Yamini. And I've been chipped in here and there, kibitz on various things. And uh, I wasn't going to mention the role of providing you with Larry and Sergey's money, but uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> happy to be the intermediary of that fruitful collaboration. And I think the, the two most important things Google Org ever supported was CPR and Prothem, both of which have been far more successful than Google Org itself. Um, that said, I'm now acquiring, I'm constantly shedding hats and acquiring hats, and I'm not shedding a CPR hat, but I'm acquiring a hat of a group, a little think tank that I have co-founded called Labor Mobility Partnerships. And so... Partly what I'm talking about is the agenda that we are hoping to make into reality over the coming years of creating, and we'll get to the ways in which in the space of um, people moving, we're unique. So you'll notice I'm talking about labor mobility and not migration. Uh, there are lots of reasons people move, and uh, I'm just talking about uh, moving to actually engage in economic activities. So uh, I want to make sort of four interrelated points and would like to do it relatively quickly so we can get to the discussion to it seems overly prepared to me um uh you don't know what i'm doing oh <laughs> that's true you the experienced uh <laughs> so uh four points the first is um we're not really talking about i i did I sometimes think I'm talking about the future of labor mobility, but I want to emphasize the future is labor mobility. I really believe it's going to happen. And what I'm more focused on is making it happen in ways that creates better opportunities for people in which people, the movement is uh, more protective of people as they move. The movement is fair to the choice of who gets to move. Um, people are adequately compensated for their skills because we have a way of documenting and having their skills. So, I'm, um, you know, I think the future is labor mobility, and then we want to talk about the future of labor mobility. So, the the I think the future of, of labor mobility is that we're going to get more and better labor mobility in core skill jobs, and we'll get back to what I mean by core skill in a minute. It needs a good private sector industry of people who move people, and this industry of people who move people have to handle the five key facilitating functions that can make movement of labor between two countries uh, work. Um, and I think that's going to be central to making this uh, a positive thing um, that can get and stay on political agendas in a legitimate way. Um, third, I want to talk about the first thing, uh, whenever anyone presents anything about labor mobility, everyone will always point out to me that the politics is the problem, of which I am fully aware. Um, but I I'm going to make a few arguments as to why I think the political long jam in rich countries that has prevented the evolution this way is breaking very fast, breaking much faster than we think, and I think will um, be broken. And so there's going to be a simultaneous kind of creation of uh, labor mobility uh, 
uh, activities that demonstrate the legitimacy of it, but then just the needs are going to change the view very fast. And then finally, I want to talk about, since I'm here in India, I want to talk about India's role. And with the G20 presidency, presidency um, I think <laughs> there's a big opportunity for India to take a leadership role in creating a global public good uh, of the regulation and structure of legal pathways. <laughs> and this is an issue on which I think uh, India is almost uniquely positioned to lead. Uh, it, it can be the dominant player rather than a minor player in a very important in the creation of a very important uh, global structure. So the first is the developing world has a growing problem, and that is they're not growing. Uh, the developed world, for whatever reasons, uh, has decided to not have children. So made in Germany is uh, declining. <laughs> Make in Germany is thriving but made in Germany <laughs> is declining. And so the important thing is not that the population is going to shrink. The important the thing over their foreseeable future is the inversion of the demographic pyramid. So everybody talks and say, oh, population in China or population in country X uh, is stagnating. But that that's... <laughs> that's... <laughs> that's not really the... Uh, Welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, the issue isn't that the population is growing down 1%. The issue is that the population is going down 1% in a very particular way, in that there's going to be way more old people and way fewer younger people. So the overall population is going to shrink 1%, but that's not because the old are going to shrink. They're going to have many more old and many few younger. And so you've got entirely different future trajectories, the old are going to grow, the workforce stage are going to shrink, and that's going to create labor scarcity. Um, that is just going to be the overwhelming feature of OECD economies into the foreseeable future. And the foreseeable future, I mean 2050, because I know after that I'll be dead. So the foreseeable future for me <laughs> maxes at 2050. Um, in the very long run, of course, this reverses, but that's another story. So now, fortunately, the rest of the world has exactly the opposite problem, which is particularly in um, India and in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's going to be a, a growing, um, there's going to be about, there's going to be about, and I'll get to these numbers in the next slide, but there's going to be about 1.4 million more uh, workforce aged people uh, over the next 30 years in these countries. And Finding jobs for 1.4 billion people is the pressing and not so far success, very successfully engaged activity for all of these governments. And on the kind of standard projections, um, you know, at feasible, optimistic, you know, uh, growth of their economies, they're still only going to create jobs for about 800 million of the 1.4 million. So there's going to be a significant fraction especially concentrated among youth that are going to not really have, um, uh, as an economist, I dislike the word unemployed, they're not going to be engaged in productive enterprise. You know, they're going to find something to do, but it's not going to be a good job, certainly, and probably won't provide a living wage. So now, as an economist, we love differences because differences create trade. Uh, you know, uh, Columbus was looking for India because India had spices and Europe didn't. Um, and the future is the rich world is not going to have people in the, and, uh, India and Africa are and connecting those two things. Here's a little more detail about why this is so important because, you know, if you do standard count, just do the count, the forecasts of the zero migration scenarios produced by the UN, um, there's going to be about a hundred million more old people in the OECD. Now, the way in which the social contract and is the OECD is structured, the young pay for the old. It's a pay-as-you-go support of the aged. And it was built when workforce aged to older was like five to one. It's already down to less than three to one. And so if you say, okay, if we want to maintain that ratio, uh, we're going to need uh, uh, we're going to need 300 million more workers. 
But the made in OECD is not going to provide 100 million more workers. It's going to provide 100 million less workers. So you're going to have 100 million more old, 100 million less young, but the old create both fiscally and otherwise actually a huge demand for workers. And so you're about 400 million by 2050. There's going to be about you're going to be about 400 million people short of having what I would regard as a minimally stable uh, population pyramid. And so that's what that's what's being shown on the right hand side is this very, you know, again, the, the arithmetic of this can get more or less complicated, but it always comes out with roughly the same numbers. Like there's going to be about 100 million more old, going to be about uh, uh, 100 million less young. Uh, you know, you can fiddle with what you think the sustainable ratio is. It's certainly not two to one uh, where it's headed in the absence of migration. Um, so, so there's a massive, massive. Um, and then on the right hand, on the left hand side, I'm showing exactly the flip problem in the developing world. There's going to be, um, you know, the population is going to go up. The workforce age is going to go up by 1.1 billion. And so there's 400 million to spare. Uh, fortunately, it's not a global labor force shortage. It's a rich country labor force shortage. So that's the first thing. I think one thing we know for sure about the future is demography. Because everybody who is going to be uh, a 30-year-old worker in 2050 <laughs> was born a couple of years ago. So forecasting how many 30-year-olds are going to be is actually one of the reliable things we can forecast far into the future. So, um, and this is just another articulation of the same basic logic of the green is kind of the needed workers that need to be to OECD. The far right le leftmost bar is the total increment to labor in the poor countries. So you still would have you wouldn't have to denude the poor world of young workers in order to uh, fulfill all of the 400 million. Um, so I think, so the first thing is there's de demographically, there's going to be a massive pressure for labor mobility just for the same reason there's a massive uh, pressure for an industry that moves oil or an industry that moves spices or an industry that moves anything. It exists in one place and doesn't exist in the other. Now, the second thing is that fortunately for the rich countries, they're rich. And they're rich because they've developed super high productivity economies. And since they've developed super high productivity economies, this means the wage gains of an exactly identical equal productivity worker moving from a low productivity place to a high productivity place is massive. So... The left-hand side, and for some reason, the, the scale changed. But this is just comparing a whole bunch of completely different ways of estimating what would be the net gain to, uh, uh, and we I don't like the term low skill, I call core skill. And I just mean that they're not necessarily having lots of formal training and or formal education, but they have the core skills that are needed in the labor force plus some training. So we have, you know, uh, an array of estimates of comparing workers, not, you know, average wages between India and average wages in the U.S., that's stupid, but comparing what would an equal productivity worker make in the two locations. The one I prefer is the equal productivity worker number because I published that paper. Um, <laughs> and so it's obviously far and away the best estimate. But our estimate is on average across the demographically potential countries in the world, there'd be about a $17,000 a year gain. Gain. It's not that they would make 17. It would be that they would move from making four to making about uh, 23. So 17,000 gain per person who moves. Uh, this is just massive. Um, and it would mean, suppose... And now I'm headed to what I want to talk about. I think if you think about how the rich world is going to cope with the 400 million labor shortage, they're going to cope with it in two ways. They're going to cope with it by the global war for talent. They are going to attempt to use their superior productivity economies to attract the best and the brightest from the developing world. And those are the people who 
they are going to create mechanisms that are potentially path to citizenship. <coughs> but so far, they have been very reluctant to create immediate path to citizenship channels for core skill workers for a variety of reasons. So I think what's going to happen in the future is the rich countries are going to separate the question, who is on who is now a citizen or on a path to be a citizen of country, and who will I allow to work in my country? And once they separate those questions, they're going to create the opportunity for time-limited, rotational, whatever you want to call it, labor mobility, where you can come, specified period, otherwise restricted, maybe in terms of which sector you work in or... And and let's say it's half-half. Let's say half of the additional mobility is rotational. That would create the economy the size of France. So uh, we're talking, you know, trillions. This isn't billions of gain. This is trillions of gain. The gains from labor mobility are bigger than the gains from addressing climate change. No one wants to hear that, <laughs> but... If you look at the optimal path for climate change versus the existing path and say, what are the net present value of the gains to the global economy of addressing climate change? They're smaller than liberalizing and allowing the additional productivity that comes from allowing people to move. And the beauty of this is it's additional productivity. This isn't a transfer. This is just allowing people to work in more productive places, which mean they create more product. So you're creating an incremental economy the size of France. Maybe I should choose better than France. People don't like France very much. Barth doesn't. I mean, Barth, your food. In gains more, more, the gains with more than climate is assuming the planet doesn't dry up completely. Again, it's, it's, if you take the estimates that are out there. That's the, no, that's the Nordhaus Weizmann story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, again, I said what I said, and what I said was right. If you, I mean, again, there's a, again, he's making the perfectly correct point that there's a large distribution of potential losses to climate change, and some of those high, you know, some of the low probability scenarios actually have very high damages, but the average, you know, I'm not an anti-climate change guy, just take what's out there as the estimates of, you know, any economist that has a model of with and without optimal control and what's the gain to the optimal control of climate change versus business as usual. It adds up to about 24 trillion and NPV. We're getting, we're getting, um, <laughs> uh, 3 trillion, 3.4 trillion a year out of additional labor mobility. So again, NPV wise, it's, it's bigger. But that's true. I, I'm not, and again, ugh. no, I get driven nuts because you can't say it's like climate change is the new religion. I, it's like I've insulted you if I say that climate change isn't the most important and only thing in the world. Somehow, I've, I'm anti climate change. I'm just saying there's other things in the world, um, and there are other things in the world that, by the way, are immediate and can be done today. So anyway. Um, <laughs> Not that I, oh, I should get the bee out of my bonnet. Um, so, and by the way, uh, and I just can't resist this, but, um, you know, if you look at the currently popular, let's do what works to create anti-poverty programs, the efficacy of letting a person move from a low productivity to a high productivity economy is orders and orders of magnitude better than the best that can be done. So there's been a multi-country estimate of the graduation programs and the net of those, and this is, you know, gold standard RCT, you spend $4,500 in two years on the program to generate 344 additional dollars in income. That's the gold standard of anti-poverty programs. And again, the logic is really simple. You're in a poor place. <laughs> so... Even if you're doing the best you can in a poor place, we can only incrementally increase your productivity. Or, you know, say we increase your productivity 10%. That's a terrific thing. Might have a high cost benefit ratio, but it's 10% of a small number. Whereas the estimates of wage gains are factor multiples. It goes up by a factor of five. And nothing you can 
do in C2 as anything like a factor of five impact. So, um, and again, this is, you know, again, I'm not criticizing doing anti-poverty programs, but even the best anti-poverty program is operating by incrementing the productivity while you stay in a low productivity place. Okay. The last sort of, the last of the points of the first point <laughs> is that um, the, the common belief is that technology has destroyed low-skilled jobs. This is just false. Uh, technology has made high skills more remunerative, but has really destroyed middle-skilled jobs. It's destroyed jobs that are routine, both physically routine, like factory work that can be automated, and intellectually routine, like bookkeeping and simple things that can now be done better with computers. So in the middle range of skills in the OECD, uh, there's been real higher change in the demand for and hence increase in the wages of the upper skilled and the middle skilled have fared badly. But the lowest skilled occupations have actually grown as much as the high skilled relative to the labor force because so far at least they are not amenable to automation. Cleaning a hotel room uh, is not something that with 10 to the 10th of Moore's law, we've gotten any better at yet. Um, you know, we, we, we are nowhere near having a machine that can dress, dress your grandmother. Uh, or my mother, your grandmother. But, um, <laughs> but you know, helping an elder person get out of bed and get dressed is like, is still a function that is in increasing demand. It has not been displaced by technology. And if you look at actually the forecasts of labor and needs of incremental jobs in the rich world, the bulk of them are non-tradable, labor-intensive, non-routine work. So, so what's happening in the world is that these jobs are growing, the total population is shrinking, the share of the native-born population that wants the jobs is shrinking, and so you've just got entire industries that are facing you know, huge shortages. So there's about 22, five, 22 million people in the OECD and aged care today. There's going to be an incremental 13 million jobs in elder care. There's going to be an incremental 100 million less workers. <laughs> so, you know, this, this, the, the, the story of how you come up with 13 million people to work in care work when you have 100 million less people and all of them want to run up the right side of the skill distribution and be nurses and doctors is, um, again, the case for filling jobs in the core skill, um, non-routine manual work um, is very strong and, and, and it's not going away. Like AI is not going to dress your grandmother. Not now, not 10 years, not 20 years. And again, maybe after 2050, um, but not in the near future. Um, so, so therefore, there's just, <laughs> can we eliminate that thing that's blocking what my slides say? <laughs> or move it? Oh, that's yeah. The bar is right on top of my... Sorry, yeah, okay, can I have the... So we... Wow, heck savvy bar here. Uh, <laughs> well, I unsee, but I don't have the right... I've moved something down. Oh, that was there. Somehow, there's something in the. Move down. Was it this white banner? But. But now. I was looking me in the drawers. What? Ah, there we go. Thank you very much. So, so, upshot of the first set of things is. The future of the world is labor mobility. Demographics have created powerful pressures for movement. Weight differentials in productivity create massive economic gains from allowing people to move. And the technological pattern of change in its polarizing form has been terrible for the politics of rich countries, but terrific for the opportunities for core skilled workers. So those three mean the future is massive labor scarcities in all of the OECD countries 
in a variety of needed occupations on top of just a general uh, labor scarcity as the population pyramid inverts. So this creates a massive opportunity for shared benefit. Now, Bethel. now I've disabled the, now we've disabled the, be able to move it. Oh, this would celebrating. <laughs> Premature celebration. Ah, <laughs> or, ah, wow. Okay. So, so the second part of my argument is that the solution is going to involve the creation of an industry of people who move people. And in order to match the needs of employing sectors and industries in the rich world with the supply of labor from other places, you need to carry out five functions. People need to be recruited. People need to be prepared. People need to be placed. People need to be protected. And people need to be returned. And those are five functions that one way or another for somebody to move from India to Germany and carry out a job need to happen. And we can imagine those happening in a variety of ways. I think the way in which it's the bet that's going to happen the best <laughs> is that if we admit that we need a private sector industry that does this for a living, that the value of the industry is carrying out these functions that are remunerated from these for these functions by being compensated out of the wage gains, like every broker or middleman or wholesaler. And moreover, if we create an industry who is doing this, we can develop global standards, we can enforce global regulation, we can create an upward uh, cycle of how these things are done, how we share how to do them well, um, in the, the way that the global industries have improved. <laughs> so I could talk briefly about these five things, but I think um, thinking through these five things um, are the agenda of, uh, <clears throat> of a regulatory and policy apparatus that creates the, the, the terms legally on which a worker is going to move across countries should recognize that there's an intermediary. The sooner we recognize that this is going to be intermediated and regulate the process through the intermediary rather than regulate the process through the individual, I think we're going to come to a better regulatory environment. And so, as my wife puts it, my goal is to create the American Medical Association of Labor Mobility, create a professional association who is about creating high quality standards and a little bit restrained of trade. <laughs> After all, that's what, you know, as Adam Smith said, no professional association ever meets. Uh, except to conspire against the public. And so there are risks of having an industry, but there are also massive gains to having an industry. And I think creating what LAMP envisions is creating a global professional association around an industry of people with people and around how to better carry out these five functions. So dentistry gets better because dentists participate in a professional process in which suppliers for the dental industry better uh, talk about how to make dentistry better. And that's what we need for this to take off. And it's not going to happen with a globally mandated international structure of laws because ultimately every receiving country is going to control its migration exactly like it wants to control its migration. So there's not going to be some WTO-like mechanism that makes it homogenous. But there can be a mechanism that encourages sharing of knowledge about how these five functions can be carried about. Recruit, prepare, place, protect, and return. So, um, you know, this is not something that's unique to the industry. Um, many industries go through a, a period in which the original the innovation comes along. It's risky. It's dangerous. They don't really know how to do it well. So this is a graph showing on one axis the fatalities per passenger mile in the airline industry. And in 1920, it was really, really dangerous to fly. Um, what do they do? They develop the needs of, what do you need to fly safely? Well, you need trained pilots. You need aircraft that fly safely and reliably. You need air traffic control that guides planes. You need airports where they land. You need a whole array of infrastructure, and not necessarily in the physical sense, um, the infrastructure that supports an industry. 
And as you develop the industry that makes an industry safe and effective, you can scale it. So as air travel got safe and reliable, the magnitude of air travel could take off and it could become a huge industry. That's basically what we're talking about. The current industry around moving people is awful. It's criminal. It's abusive. It's exploitative because it hasn't yet come up into acknowledging that it's going to exist and how do we make it better? So I feel like, so I feel like we're in the, uh, well, I'll get to this maybe, but we're still in the prohibition. You know, America decided at one point in its history to out, outlaw the sale of alcohol, which basically criminalized alcohol. And once you criminalized alcohol, guess who controlled it? Criminals. Uh, um, and they ultimately, the United States decided that we really weren't going to get rid of alcohol consumption. What we were going to do is have chronically criminalized alcohol consumption and we want a better regulated alcohol, we need to legal up. Made it legal again, but it's still super highly regulated, super highly taxed, right? Um, in every state in America. So we're not moving from, a, you know, so what we want is to create a good industry from the existing often terrible industry. So that's the second point. Second point is, I think what makes us relatively unique <laughs> in the space of advocacy for labor mobility is, well, several things. One, we're interested on labor mobility, not migration. So we're about rotational. Second, we think high skill is going to take care of itself through normal political processes, but the, the core skill is under, under research, under acknowledged, under kind of um, thought about. Third, we're, we believe that having an industry is going to be the way forward and that we acknowledge in the policies and regulations that there are these intermediaries, that these intermediaries are going to be compensated, that these intermediaries the modus operandi of regulation from both sides. Um, now, the last thing is the current obstacles to higher level of mobility are entirely the politics of rich countries. And the politics of rich countries is blocked between um, employing sectors who increasingly want more and the general population is very nervous. And our argument is this is going to change very fast. Uh, I think my... John Maynard Keynes famously once said when accused of having changed his position that when the facts change, I changed my mind. What do you do? Uh, in the 1930s, everybody in America could have made very articulated, very widely believed arguments about why women shouldn't be in the labor force. And then World War II came and America needed women in the labor force. And guess what changed? <laughs> Attitudes changed. And attitudes change very fast. Regulations change. They change very fast. And there was this massive, if you can see, there was this massive uptick, in, uh, particularly in married women's labor force participation, that never went back. So I think first is the facts are going to change and the facts on the ground are going to change people's mind, that people are ultimately going to decide, I'm happy to have well-regulated labor mobility if it can get my grandmother good chair or if it can get... Um, you know, the variety of core skilled jobs that are necessary to a functioning economy. And then second, I think there's going to be there's going to be a recognition recognition. Again, this is the prohibition point. The only way to better labor mobility and more secure coal of the borders is more legal pathways. But there's a group that keep thinking we're going to secure the border at the border <laughs> and we're going to secure the border with less. And we can have a secure border. We, all the world, can have secure borders that are porous, meaning that people go back and forth all the time. So, you know, you can have safe trade at very high levels of trade. We can have secure movement of labor at very high levels of labor mobility. So, um, you know, the mealy mouth kind of commitment, global commitments to um, labor mobility often refer to ordered mobility. And the way to order is through more. The only way to order is through more, in my view, because the demand for labor mobility is so high, you just can't stop it. So I'm going to, and I have some other stuff here, but I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip and get to the end. Um, I'm going to skip. Basically, what these arguments is, is that if you look, we feel mm -hmm. that many of the arguments, the reasons why rich country voters are nervous about labor mobility as it comes bundled with lots of other things. You know, 
because people talk about open borders and they were well, if we have open borders, we'll lose control of our national identity. We'll lose control of our culture. Um, they worry about disorder. And, and I think if you allow a country, a, a, an array of options to where we can decide how many workers are going to be allowed on a rotational basis to do this. And separately, we're going to decide on how many people are going to come as citizens. You can lower the temperature, the discussions about labor mobility and make them much larger levels of labor mobility than would be possible if you continue to force the joint. And you can create legitimate and ordered migration. So people some people are worried that, you know, the, the temporary mobility are exploited and abused, and there's super high risks of that, and it's very common. But it can be regulated if we make it legal and bring it an, into a, a, a regulated structure. Um, so I, I feel that there's this anxious middle that isn't fundamentally against migration, isn't fundamentally nativist and just xenophobic and just hates other people. It's they have legitimate concerns, but these legitimate political concerns can be addressed. And so we can tip the anxious metal towards a more favorable to labor mobility view. So the last is, I feel this is a win-win opportunity for India. Um, it's win domestically because between 2020 and as we all know, I mean, uh, just in the recent weeks, you <laughs> India has been in the news for becoming the biggest uh, country in the world. Uh, you we all know that you have a used bulge. There's about 210, according to the standard UN projections, about 210 million workers. Uh, I don't think anybody realistically believes you're going to find good jobs in India for 210 million workers in the next 30 years at any reasonable, even at rapid growth rates. Um, and suppose you know, workers in the core skill rotational jobs reach even Gulf levels, that there's as many people in the OECD as they're on the Gulf. And the Gulf is, of course, incredibly smaller as markets than the OECD. That adds up $450 billion to earnings of Indian work. It's just a massive net gain to Indian workers. Um, this is an integral part of a youth employment strategy because rotational mobility is going to be taken advantage of most by youth. So the youth transition school to work, uh, youth are going to be the most likely to move abroad to handle these jobs and means and domestic for the domestic policy of India, India taking a lead role in being a global actor means the Indian political leadership is seen as protecting and encouraging that Indian workers are treated with dignity, Indian workers are protected, Indian workers are fairly compensated for their skills. So I think it is not, uh, you know, this is, is the Indian leadership is not saying, well, we couldn't find jobs for everybody, so we're going to provide cheap and unskilled labor abroad. It's we can it's make an India made in India. We have people with poor skills. The world needs them as long as they're paid and treated fairly and with dignity. Why wouldn't we pursue that as an economic strategy? And why would we take leadership in creating that globally? And that it's a win domestically. I think it's a win internationally because there's no other global domain in which India has similar dominant status going into the future. Uh, Two hundred million workers, about one in five incremental workers available in the world. So if there is going to be rotational mobility, India is going to be a very big part of it. Um, second, India can be seen as moving to greater responsibility in the global sphere, that they're not always acting in the narrow interests of India in every international negotiation, but they're going to be the umbrella leader of the South in creating the global public goods that favor this mobility that provides gains across the board. Um, India comes into this with a lot of experience already. Uh, it is, you know, there are more Indian nationals in the Gulf than there are Arabs. And so there's a long history that has both positive and some very negative lessons. And so you can go into the, let's create a structure of future of mobility of work that looks a lot better than what we have in the Gulf. So no one's saying, let's do in Germany what is being done in the Gulf. Let's do in Germany what we can do, learning from the lessons uh, of the Gulf. And finally, I think a G presidency agenda in the very short run of one earth, one family, one future, uh, putting labor mobility on the table creates a positive space for India to create countervailing pressures. <laughs> the G20 loves to pressure India to do so. 
uh, an India often doesn't have a positive agenda of like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 we want to address climate change, but we want you to address, <laughs> create these economic opportunities for Indian workers. Like, how about a little quid pro quo? And this is a super positive agenda for India. To, to you know, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, all the issues in the world aren't going to be solved by India doing what the rest of the world wants. Let's have the rest of the world do some stuff that would really make India better off. And I think integral, having an agenda like that would make the G20 a lot more so. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Appropriately provocative, and you can save climate change, KP. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, no, thanks, Germany, and uh, thanks, Lime. Thanks, along with the uh, very, really, very really interesting presentation. And to, back to what Yamini said at the beginning, uh, it won't be incorrect to say that a lot of what I know about the Indian state, of which I was a part for many years, is from you. <laughs> so, uh, thanks again, and, and thanks also for the numbers. I think in the light of what Yamini said recently in her Deccan error piece on numbers in India, <laughs> so it's useful to actually have serious numbers with which we can make an argument. Uh, let me first uh, very quickly look at how this has moved in the past and uh, have some suggestions uh, in addition to what you've made. A purely both science, the exporting, labor exporting countries and quote unquote the importing countries will gain by international mobility. There is a clear play gap, there is a wage gap. And so like international mobility of goods, it's I think worth wondering and you alluded to it. Why does this not happen? And then there's a lot of literature on the politics and stuff like that. But if you look at the history of international mobility, both of uh, goods and some factors of production. In addition to other things, A, for instance, take capital. There was, first of all, even in the case of goods, there were clear gainers and losers. So there is an argument, familiar public policy argument, that we need to address. But equally, for instance, with the movement of capital, there was a serious concern about Stability. Potentially, when I have a capital defeat country, there is clear advantage in getting capital from abroad. But it doesn't come purely with just benefits. There are stability concerns, which are now very well known, well documented. And I think identical concerns exist here. And, and in this case, it's not financial stability, it's quote unquote some notion of social stability or cultural stability. And here also it's interesting the way, for instance, the IMF's position the international movement of capital evolved over a period of time. Unmitigated gain and everybody should do it to a much more nuanced, uh, you know, there are arguments for capital controls in certain situations, type situations. So I think there are parallels here. I want to, you know, with that background, come to the Indian example, and it's actually surprising that bilaterally, we have done almost everything that you've talked about. We have exported labor in the past, historically, you know, uh, very unskilled, and then moved to a phase where it was super skilled, you know, the best doctors, a uh, whole bunch of professionals, very talented people, and much more recently, a lot of the movements at the not so skilled, semi skilled level to the Gulf, some cases to Malaysia, etc. And and there are many more examples uh, that I can go on. But 2017 to 19, I actually led a lot of these conversations by rightfully. And some of these conversations were very interesting. Almost every country that we went and sort of had conversation with. On of that, Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, everybody wanted some government intermediation. 
they were clear that the recipient entity will be a private sector entity and the sinking entity in India will also be a private sector entity. So to that extent, it's exactly the point that you made, that you need an industry which deals with people, with mobility of people, and the recipient clearly is the private sector. Because a lot of the <clears throat> employers in the recipient fund, we in the private sector employers, but they wanted government intermediation mm -hmm. for some very specific rules because a lot of these positions or occupations are also regulated. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you are a nurse, it's a regulated activity and it's regulated in the recipient country, regulated in the exporting country. So there was a clear role that they wanted the stain to play. And the tribal companies on both sides also wanted government intermediation, but very clear, narrowly defined role for government. So I think like a lot of other areas, we need this appropriate mix of markets and the right role for the state, the recipient state and the sending state. We've had a labor exporting industry in India, and it's a terrible industry. It's a extremely corrupt. Its entire business depended on being on the right side of an agency called Protector of Immigrants, an office creator in our 1968 legislation. So exporting manpower export agencies have to go and register with this regulator. And it is a old spy badly designed regulator and it's uh, you know best not discussed that, that agency is not exactly a great agency and nobody wants to deal with that agency but we need an agency somewhat similarly placed so what did we do it was a very interesting experiment that we tried out this was with japan it is a program called technical intern training program, eh? TITP. Japanese actually passed a legislation. And it's interesting how they had handled the politics of labor coming into Japan. The unions were opposed to it, notwithstanding the fact that there are shortages in every area <clears throat> that you would list, including dressing the grandmother that you talked about. That was one of their biggest demands. Wellness workers for old age security, there's some formal title for that, and in all kinds of places at salaries that are mind boggling, multiples of Indian salaries. Now, the Japanese actually got a legislation done in their parliament, but they cleverly said this is not importing of labor, this is importing of. Technical interns. So here is a nurse who has completed an academic qualification, but skills is equally about academic qualification plus on the job experience. The on the job experience will be in Japan. And it is initially for a period of three years, extendable by two, and in no case extendable beyond five. And no technical intern can become a Japanese citizen in that realm. Right. You can go back, stand in the standard queue for citizenship, you are welcome to apply. But as a TITP, you can't become a Japanese citizen. And they were very keen to sign an agreement with India, which was a little perplexing for us because we were not used to you know, being received by Japanese ministers for importing labor. So the answer he gave was very interesting. He said, one reason why we want you guys here, if you don't look like us, it's very difficult for you guys to vanish into Japan and not side. <laughs> so we've had a bad experience importing people from other Southeast Asian countries and the last round they had problems with was Nepal. And he was standard enough to say, 
there are two reasons why we want you guys. It is a bulk of the guys who come from your country are very clear that they are here for the wages. They actually think very poorly of our court. They think very poorly of our fellow church. <laughs> These are guys who want to earn, send money born. And three years later, five years later, yeah. the note would come earlier, not on the GRTP, have been going back. So they wanted and they gave us nahas, which we kept rejecting because we said we are not in a position to supply these kinds of mouths. For instance, one demand was 500 strawberry farmers. <laughs> Can you imagine? And we managed to get two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> From a training center in Allahabad, of all places, this required a Japanese language training. And the Japanese language agency came here and administered a written test an interview. So in Chennai, for instance, uh, the next time, since you will please go to Chennai often, there are some Japanese ITIs. These kids can speak Tamil and they can speak Japanese. They don't know a word of English, they don't know Hindi, because they have found from ITIs into ITIs which have been designed, keeping in mind Japanese regulatory requirement, and they clear the preliminary exam in India before they can apply to the GITP and become interns. And this whole thing worked well because the theory from our side was the National Skill Development Corporation, which is 51% private sector, 49% government. But at that point in time, it actually ran like a private company, but it had some public interest directly. So, it was a nice combination of state and markets. And the counterpart agency in Japan is the Japanese Chamber of Commerce. Mm. And then they dedicated it to regional chambers of commerce. So, both sides were represented by institutions. Behind them were... So, NSDC wasn't actually training people. NSDC was sourcing them from trainers who had been registered with NSDC and also approved by the Japanese Occupational Regulator. So, in case we were sourcing uh, uh, old age, uh, you know, uh, geriatric care workers from the Northeast, they were screened, cleared by the Japanese Nursing Council. So, bilaterally, we ended up establishing these very costly systems. And we have now done, likewise, for instance, there are Gulf countries. There are the equivalent of what we in India call the RTU, the regional transport officer who gives driving licenses. Gulf countries have actually established branch officers in Rajasthan. They come here, they spend a month. So the heavy duty vehicle drivers, after they complete their training in international training centers, are tested, licensed by those Kuwait or UAE licensing authorities and then the export takes place. And plus, this is also begun <clears throat> where it's not intermediated by the state. For instance, you may have heard of the city and gears lined up. This is the community private sector agency, which is a certifying agency. They certify plumbers, they certify electricians. This certification is recognized by Dubai. So, if you want to be a plumber in a municipally approved facility in Dubai, you need to have a city and years plumbing license. Yeah. It's an expensive license. It's 30, 40,000 Indian rupees. And the certification costs another 10, 20,000 bucks. So, it's an expensive process. But now, more intermediaries have come up in the space who are doing this on a large scale. But all of this is happening bilaterally. Right. And I think what we need to now do is to move this to a multilateral space. And there, I have a suggestion, which is what I think we should next work on. There is a, an occupational classification system. For instance, we use, use the word carpenter. Now, who's a carpenter? Carpenter is a guy who can just maybe, you know, cut a piece of wood. But it's also a carpenter who does uh, you know, soundproofing of this building. So, 
in the international nomenclature, there is carpenter level 1, the carpenter level 10. Level 10 is actually a PhD in carpentry. <laughs> so the level movement is much more physical skills to much more cerebral skills as you move the hierarchy. Now, India has a national classification of occupations published in 2014. The green aligned with something for the international classification of occupations, which came out in 2008. But to give an illustration, you know, one of our largest uh, skill development product is this sewing machine operator. Uh, a person who works in those sweatshops in Tirupur and produces garments that are exported to the rest of the world. Now, I, out of curiosity, went and checked. In the international system of classification of occupations, this has a four-digit port, 8153, sewing machine operator. In the United States, it has a six-digit port, very different, for sewing machine operator, but in Australia and New Zealand, they are sewing machinist. In Germany, it's a very different occupation, doing the same thing but the classification. And Canada has yet another classification. Now, if you recall, 1988, the World Customs Organization came up with this harmonized what is called commodity description and coding system. The eight-digit classification where this is identity term wherever you are on the board. Uh, no. So there is a four digit classification followed by four more digits, which gives countries enough scope. For instance, India may have a Rangoli maker, which exists only in India. There is scope for that. But there is also scope to switch back into the international classification of occupations. And like the commodity classification, the classification of occupations also has in it the micro credentials of skills. So we find a machinist. Yeah. The word machinist level has a meaning which says I can do one, two, three, four, five, six with this degree of precision. Because we all we don't really understand the word neurosurgeon. For we don't understand more, yeah. steering machine operator with the same degree of precision. Now, I think what India could potentially push for is can the world arrive at an international system of classification of occupations, which are not really the occupations, but occupations backed by what is the jet? Jarvam is called bonification packs testing mechanisms and certificates which are recognized across the globe. I think this is the information infrastructure which is a classic global board, public board, to handle the information asymmetry which is rampant in this in this world. So I think the potential for doing a lot of risk is currently being exploited bilaterally, but I think it is an excellent case to move this internationally. And countries can still decide. Malaysia may decide, I don't want to get nurses, I only want proper dirt. Some other country decides, I want nurses. And the TIDP has also taught us how the Japan numbers are already in 2 to 3,000. It's not a small number. And the relevance of the base. The average ITI operator now sends home two and a half, three lakh Indian rupees per month. And this is after using expenses, social security, taxes, and we have actually placed in Japan an NSDC team which has the responsibility to carry out those five tasks. Do they need counseling? So we have stationed travel knowing. Uh, you know, Northeast language knowing counselors, because that turned out to be a media requirement. You suddenly place a 22 year old kid in the back part. He or she needs serious help counseling. Does she have a help bag? This was a requirement in DIDP. The 
exporting country had to set up a head back. Hmm. So lots of bilateral experiments, which I think need to be documented. And I think we have a, and, and it's a classic, I think, uh, subject for India to push. As you said, it's a relatively positive rather than just critical agenda of past G20. This is a, you know, potentially a sort of new positive idea. And uh, I think this is worth pursuing. And uh, I have a title for, for, you know, our next initiator. Going back to what you said about Columbus, scared labor mobility is a new spice group. Well, not, 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 not. <laughs> that's that's the way we want the action, but I think it's a great idea and a lot of uh, serious, interesting possibilities. Pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, KP. I think the floor is open now uh, for questions. Uh, so those on Zoom, please put your questions on Zoom and I'll try and pick them up. Uh, but Vines, let's start with you. The only catch is that we need to have a mic. Uh, can you just, oh, Brooke, they can me. Sorry. Can I? So thanks. I just ask a little bit about the political sensitivity uh, in, in host countries. Um, specifically the worry that it may not end up being rotated. That sort of you initially say like you have a guest worker program of Tur Turkish immigrants to Germany and then they just stay, right? right. And it, I'm just wondering again anecdotally that is it coincidental that the countries where these kind of rotational mobility programs have worked best have broadly been dictatorships like the Gulf where you know you uh, you know you can you know after spending X number of years you know you have to leave. They're immune to pressures, you know, of migrants for citizenship or some pathway to citizenship. Um, whereas in the West, the the enormous mistrust among you know among the population that look when when migrants come on these rotational programs, will they leave after seven years? Will they leave after eight years? I mean, KP spoke about the Japanese example where you know Indians are dying to come back and eat Indian food, right? But at least in the, you know, is it just a misconception issue and, you know, when the facts change, people will change their mind? Or will there be this lingering fear that political action makers, you know, will push for, you know, mobility, but over time it won't rotate? In Tolton. In Only in Tolton. Expensive. No, 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 no. Like so, Joe. So, so, this is, in some sense, one of the reasons why it's important to have an industry, because the existing mechanisms of and and this problem is a much larger problem in the U.S. than other places, but the existing mechanisms in which there's worker overstay are usually because the worker has made their way into the country by themselves. And so the enforcement mechanism is the legal enforcement mechanisms of the host country trying to track those down and deport them. That's expensive, it's dangerous, it's politically unpopular, it's everything. Whereas if you have a firm in India who's responsible for return, then you have control of the firm. And the firm and organize itself to ensure return quite easy. So I, I, I actually don't think returning the, the... So, first of all, we need to do something because the guest workers in Turkey were never scheduled to go back. It wasn't that they overstayed, right? The guest worker program was never a guest worker program. Um, so, that's like... like it's everybody's favorite example, and it's just raw. Right? It's just raw. <laughs> but I think... This is a logistical, this is a regulatory and logistical problem that can be solved once you say the only legal pathway to be working in the country is to be placed here by a labor broker. Then once you've got labor brokers, regulation depends on concentration. You need, you need to have control of a relatively few number of people. And I think once you acknowledge that, uh, then the whole enforcement thing becomes orders of magnitude easier. 
than if you say you you know I mean and again the U.S. is running the world's largest stupidest guest worker program. It's like if you can illegally make it across our border, you can disappear into our society and work as long as you want. And we have super expensive law enforcement mechanisms as the only way of enforcing repatriation. So partly, I think what we're doing in order to make this legitimate to the voting public is assuring them that routine, that we can handle the, the, the return problem if you have an ordered mechanism. But I don't, you know, I guess <laughs> my analogy, which isn't a good analogy with parth behind me, but it's like, look, in every city in America, there's all kinds of gas stations. Gasoline is one of the world's most explosive substances. The fatalities from gas in America are next to zero. So a country that can have a gas station in every country and not have any deaths from gas can handle return if, again, they built it into the design. I, and that, But I do think this is a first-order issue. Unless you can reassure politically <laughs> that there's going to be compliance, it's not going to happen. That's not... It were, just let's just give you that. that yeah. I think two more from the bride then hand it over to the Thanks so much for that. Especially um, seeing the figures is very interesting with the demographic trends. Uh, so I'm going to cheat because I asked you like a few different questions simultaneously. So the first one is um, with respect to incentives for industry. So for some context, like I work on labor and migration, like you know, um, and have conducted very often labor audit. And very often, even the companies that submit themselves to a labor audit have either been arm twisted because they were named called before by a labor rights organization or th there is some other incentive. Essentially, they have some kind of reputation or financial risk. Yeah. Uh, and I could see similar issues popping up with regulating the recruitment industry. So just practically in terms of incentives for the creation of this parallel industry, what would that look like um, in your estimation? So that's the first question. Right. Um, and the second question is uh, with respect to rotational. Yeah. The question is actually like, why rotational as opposed to say some kind of alternative form of labor governance complex like what the EU came to be, like how the EU came to be, and of course it's a very utopian thinking, but where people can move across borders, yeah. the freedom of work is different, and they have a different uh, labor governance complex and system where people can move. Uh, as opposed to, so uh, what I'm trying to understand yeah. is, is, do you feel that the dividends from someone going abroad and coming back rather than getting nationalized there is really that much better than actually getting nationalized there? Because this is, uh, you know, is, is it as for your figures important for somebody to come back home, uh, even if they're right. going through a legal... So, so this is, I mean, I know that there's yeah, yeah. leaks around it and yeah, I also yeah. wanted to comment that uh, honestly, the way things work in the Gulf, I mean, a lot of us know this, but it actually hasn't worked. It fundamentally hasn't worked. People are living in like, super exploitative uh, conditions. So, um, yeah, I can share her report. My organization launched uh, during the World Cup, actually, because we launched the largest investigation on uh, worker exploitation in uh, World Cup stadiums where they were being built. Um, and the last thing is this idea of the sort of global professional association for recruitment is very interesting. So I wanted to ask, in terms of how it would be structured, do you have an idea that workers themselves will also have some kind of voice within that platform? Because one part of this whole equation, I think, is having situations like either the question of unions. So within the mig migration space, we're always grappling with this because there are either unions in the country of origin or in the country of destination. Obviously, it's very thin and in, like authoritarian states, there's bad anything because I mean, their own citizens get jailed if they try to protest or, or if there is any dissent. So uh, that is just a thought from my side. Some kind of worker representation probably go along. 
So sorry, that was a lot, but thanks. Very interesting. Do we take one more and then you can respond? Sure. Sure. And then I a couple of the questions or two. Great. Uh, thank you so much. That was just an absolutely fantastic uh, paper and discussion. Um, you know, and I was thinking, you were, um, if you, when you were talking about harmonization and standardization, so with GST, there was this whole process that happened with these HSN codes and thinking about how to think about standardization. And there was a huge amount of contestation. So how to think about, and will be this global body to think about dispute you know, resolution, like consensus building or deliberation over this right. to arrive at any form of regulation, harmonization is hard enough with things, uh, harder even so with people, right? We were talking about products so uh, and, and services, and here we are talking about people. So even more complicated, I mean, what you've thought about in terms of what kinds of deliberative structures would be required, particularly, so this was bilateral in a number of cases that and there's a reason possibly that bilateral work worked better um but you know possibly uh but then there are weaknesses also in those relationships so that was one point and related i think to your question i mean this is the difficult thing about it because it's around freedom like how does one think about your choice right and so we have things where it comes to scholarships and other things where we have a understanding of return that is built into the contract itself, right? So that you have clarity that this is the agreement, right? And so the debate has to happen prior. This is the big debate that's also happening now. We think there are things like, I mean, different types of ways of thinking about recruitment, certain number of years in service before you're asked to come back, etc. So presumably the understanding is this will all be figured out prior, uh, which raises the question of what happens post return if you spend a, quite a long time serving somewhere else uh, it raises an interesting question on labor which has been the pension question right who takes care of you when you're done laboring usually it's employers so would you have to think about potentially some kind of global pension story where if you worked in a country abroad and you go back home but who takes care of you eventually right would it be in your thinking of the whole problem, something that might come up in terms of would that then be you contribute to a common pool of pensions, thinking about how people's lives will be after, particularly if you do fairly long service and caregiving work in another country. Uh, just whether you've thought about that question in thinking about this design. Okay. Um, so, let me start from the middle of your three questions, the rotational question. I am not at all arguing that rotational is better for the movers. I mean, lots of people would love to move and become citizens of Germany. This is already a compromise proposal. It's like, because if you say to Germany, how many people will you let come to Germany on the premise that every one of them becomes a German citizen? The answer is a very low number. And, and my point is, it, I never, I'm not opposing rotational at the expense of half the citizenship. Germany, I'm saying Germany should have the option of choosing both. And once you have the option of choosing both, I think you're going to choose more total. It's not necessarily at the expense of it. And so I'm not saying rotation. I'm, I'm, I would only want rotational if we can get rotational that we wouldn't have otherwise got. As I, I, and that's just, I have libertarian friends, uh, I'm an economist, so I have lots of libertarian friends, um, who, you know, argue the compelling moral case for open borders. I'm fully on board with it's a compelling case, philosophically. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just not compelling with borders. Uh, second thing and, and this comes to several of the kind of way what we're trying to envision and promote and the reason why I want to promote an industry is that when you put a public sector organization like the ILO, quasi-public sector, the temptation to gold plate what would, needs to happen is just overwhelming. And then you create this tension to where 
they'll say, oh, in order for any labor mobility to be legitimate, it has to meet these criteria where there was never any realism in the criteria. And then the industry resists it, doesn't comply, you get these fake audits. And so I'm more interested in developing a truly organic, you know, let's build up and build into kind of program by program, what are these standards? Rather than, you know, I don't, what we're trying to avoid and why we call it partnerships is to emphasize the whole nature of multiple overlapping bilateral partnerships that involve private sector and government on both sides, rather than, you know, a multilateral organization. So, so, and I think once, you know, I, I'm a, generically, I'm a big believer that well-implemented and effective policy emerges from practices rather than as the result of dictated policies and getting the policy ahead of the practice is a risk. So that's how I envision this, this happening. Now, the difficulty is, you're, you know, with a lot of these industries, you're starting from countries in which the whole industry is criminalized now. And that transition is going to be very hard because, you know, it's better if you can start fresh. And so I think on a lot of these, what we're looking for is, again, develop incremental bilateral agreements that are outside of the existing corrupt structure. Okay. So, um, I haven't, uh, I haven't really thought through the work of participation. So let's just pound that through. It's like, I've been thinking on the other side. Um, so the, the, I guess the questions about, uh, a lot of these questions are, I think, a result of the Gulf model. And here it kind of, my generic view is um, people can acquire, I think a lot of us have a moral sense that you acquire entitlements from society by participating. And the longer you participate, the more it should be expected that you're treated equally like other people who participated for a long time. And I think the fundamental flaw in the Gulf model was to allow people to work 20 or 30 years and acquire zero titles. Now, my solution to that is for the core skill workers move to short rotation, Look, not, not have people working 15 years, 20 years where the pension issues and the post return issues where you have broken your ties. Uh, you know, something that what KP was talking about is exactly the model we're thinking of. And this is another reason, by the way, why, <laughs> I mean, between us, right, I would much rather have India as the lead negotiator about return because India would want to return much more than, say, your neighbors uh, than West. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, having had is good. So, so anyway, so mostly we're thinking of more like compulsory savings plans because compulsory savings plans also make a good mechanism to induce return. You know, you're deducting 30% of your earnings at source and you get them when you go home on a three-year contract makes a ton of sense. You can live. So, and the, the deeper pension issues, uh, we don't want to, you know, it just gets complicated, but I think just, I, I'm, I'm very, I would be very nervous if this kind of rotational got more than five years. Because, you know, I think most of us are sort of morally dubious about a country allowing you to, I mean, this is what happened with the guest work in Turkey. We just allowed Turks to live legally. They weren't, you know, illegal. And well, the problem with the Turkish experience is Germany allowed Turkish workers to come and work in Germany with no plan for return and no plan for citizenship. There wasn't a path to become a German citizen for church workers because it was defined by blood. And there was, neither was it actually a guest worker program in which you went in with the expectation that this is the contract you have entered into that you're going to go back for three years or three plus two. So, um, so anyway, I guess my answer is avoid the long term. The, the, uh, and again, this is why we're focused on you know, I want to focus on rep below professional level work because in those kinds of jobs, the learning curve is very steep. So you're essentially adequately trained after three months, in which case if your duration is three years, you know, it's fully adequate for the employer to be worth training you. 
Whereas if you're talking neurosurgeons or economics professors, it's not obvious that three years makes any sense, right? So, then the last thing on harmonization is I, I want, you know, my vision is <laughs> some sort of uh, endogenously, again, emergent harmonization on the certification issue. Because again, if you put together a multilateral committee of 18 countries and say, let's come up with what Carpenter Level 4 means, you can debate it for 19 years and boost pressure to really come to a conclusion about it. Uh, whereas if you start from there are existing agencies in the sectors, in the recipient countries, let's, you know, in the bilateral agreement, agree that if you can, you know, let's, and again, these examples, you gave her exactly what we're envisioning, which is let's move the certification that your carpenter level for from Australia to India so that when you leave India, you have carpenter level four um, and, and employers in Australia know and trust what that means, as opposed to what's going on internally in India is this massive expansion of basically everybody's trying to signal labor market things with fake degrees and fake diplomas and fake certifications and no one trusts them. So I, I think what I would start with is let's, you know, start with the bilateral and move towards a harmonized and for classification purpose, probably harmonization. But, you know, if ex ante 50 countries have to agree on what carpenter level four means, you know, you've created a permanent employment subsidy for right. negotiators or Yes. Okay. Hey, I'm going to take just a few uh, quick questions from Zoom and then Rakesh, uh, uh, I'll come to you. Um, so so I, I'll just run through a few if you can uh, respond to as many as, as, as you think uh, is viable. Um, so Harish asks, haven't these demographic shifts uh, favoring labor shortages driven the need for labor mobility been around for some time? Is there an inflection point happening in how does this reconcile to growth of nativist and right-wing opinion in Europe and the U.S.? Um, uh, we have a question that's asking about, I think you've sort of somewhat answered this, anticipated effects of rotation or temporary migration on gender dynamics of occupations or professions and on households, including effects on children. Uh, does India need to set up a manpower planning department under the Ministry of Labor? Uh, <laughs> Um, well, we can set up a department. We do that quite effectively. What it does is a matter of aging. There is one that doesn't work. Uh, there's the productivity council. Maybe uh, you know. Okay, yeah. Uh, a very interesting paper. And seven advantages of proposed labor movement in a more regulated way have been very nicely articulated. But what are the cons? Already, India, which is investing in infrastructure and industry, is facing the bottleneck of low labor productivity and shortage of skilled labor. So, what are the chances that we solve some other problem for countries' problems while we? believe uh, domestic industry and labor skills issues to fend for themselves. Thank you. Rakesh? <laughs> Sorry, let me just cross over. Well, there it is. Yeah, right? It is cool of applied manpower research in my award. It's a bit biased for him. Yeah. And then it's been forever. They probably have. It's been forever. Yeah, and the walls and it's it's a hit greater powder, but it's and then build that auto will be um no I uh there was a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't ask some of them questions because they're too many. No, from cover practice so it, Digital practice. One, um, if you look at proportions as opposed to numbers, um, how many people would have migrated in this fashion, say in the 19th century, from less well off countries than better COVID? Um, some sense of this sort of proportional magnitudes. But life's very different now. It's still a bit of a burden. Second, on this. Um, uh, certification or certification. Now, this is like the EU, right? Where you can, so anyone can work anywhere. So, presumably, they must have some kind of standardized certification for a carpenter level, whatever it is, or a nurse level, this, that, and the other. 
or is that actually a problem because they don't have, I don't know. My point really is that you do have these you know, plurilateral trade agreements. Uh, EU as a whole, RCEP is EU, European Union as a whole, and EU as a whole. So where British corporate they can go off and live in Greece if you want, the other way out. Uh, but so my question is, did they look into this? Is, is this problem solved there at, at these kind of professions, not brain surgeons? Uh, okay. But then some that could be a model for a multilateral thing. If yeah. you ever think of it, or other kind of large regional trade agreements, because mutual recognition agreements are all well known. I mean, we, it's so many. There's a very important part of most uh, regional trade agreements. And difference is something go ever go multilateral. Yeah, there's models that you can throw it up to WTO and so on. So uh, I think that th those are the on just a, a comment of the pensions and medical. I have since information technology came. I've been very curious about say even say who the kid worker. I don't see any problem in doing pensions and medical in the sense that every time it it, it should be very easy now for everyone if he's in India or Aadhaar, everyone to have an identity. Any time you pay someone, uh, for Uber or any gig worker, or this kind of right, X percent goes off into their pension account or medical. I don't see why this has not been done. It's such so easy now. Of course, you got a, that means your taxi pay will go up, which you ought to. Uh, but we're just exploiting those guys. But it's just automatic. It just you know do it. It just goes off like that every time. It's all electronic anyway. But I'm saying same thing could be done here. That uh, for whatever number of years you go off, right. um, it gets get put in somewhere and uh, you know. And so, I mean, okay. Back. So, and finally, I think the question of family is actually some of the who mentioned that I only see in this in 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 this model. I only thinking of single workers, whether it's when all of them are going off and coming back. Uh, but that raises lots of questions. Finally, one to KP at you is good. have to answer to. Yeah, presumably on this uh, industry, uh, and you will know more that there, there's lots of labor movement, this contractual, temporary labor movement in India, and they all the labor contractors. So uh, in that sense, we have that whole model. You just have to formalize it. No? So a very uh, large labor contracting industry. It is working or a lot of it is bad in yeah, yeah. like the particular major savage. So the attempt of the NSDC system was to create a relatively to be better industry. No, but I've got domestic, not internet. No, this is yes. domestic also in weeks is actually ten worker I mean and they do numbers that are astounding. They don't do a lot of the sort of manual labor of the kind that you will find the sort of uh, contractors uh, the, that you would see at construction work site. But there again, a lot of the construction companies and started promoting Jawaji for them as an entity, which is exclusively for labor contracting for them, and which now follows every legislation of any regulation. And if there are all those from Orissa, they figured out absenteeism goes so hugely if you can get to Oriya Coast. Yeah, but I think, you know, the human man making TV is great, but the Korean doesn't piece he wants. I will kill him. I don't mind with it, but fairly. So, just, there are these industries that come in war, and it's somewhat similar to war, and send her. The moment you Effectively, eat criminal life or uh, put an activity into the lethal state. Then it's very interesting to us. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. okay. So I'm very. The way to start combination of Rakesh's question. So first of all, um, I, 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 I wrote a book in 2006. Um, that turned out to be way premature, <laughs> which will get back to the first question from Zoom from Harish. But so 
The thing about the 19th century is wage differentials were tiny compared to what they are. So I think if you look at, I mean, one of the motivating things of that book is the mo the 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 gross and net mobility within the Atlantic economies was massively larger than we see labor mobility today when wage differentials between uh, Sweden and the U.S. were three. And today we have wage differentials five and six and ten, and we have tiny little fractions of that mobility. So I think if you, if you simulate open borders, the, the amounts of mobility really are huge because the wage gaps are so huge. And which is why I think open borders isn't really an option. And it's why EU has free mobility within the EU, but Turkey's never going to get into the EU for exactly that reason. So it's like, you know, you've chosen countries where the wage differentials are relatively modest relative to global wage differentials. So then at free mobility within that, but then free mobility of that is a very different thing. And, you know, the EU precisely won't let Turkey in because of the labor issues. So, so the 19th century, I think, is a good analogy, and it show, but it, what it really reveals is how dramatically under mobile labor is in the current global economies relative to what you would expect with uh, a more like system. So I, I do think these recognition issues can be solved, but again, coming back to the EU analogy, um, the EU solved mutual recognition because it only admitted people in the club who they could trust or were willing to subject themselves to the process of becoming trusted, EEU, the new e European, the new Eastern European members. Whereas the issue here is nobody's going to enter into a bilateral agreement with, say, Pakistan, in which Pakistan agencies are sending workers to Australia certifying carpenter level four just not going to happen. So it's not just mutual recognition, it's the actual mechanics of the evaluation. And I think there needs to be a, a clear enough stipulation of the process of that, and that's one step, but then the harmonization issue is going to come through the recognition. And I think we should acknowledge the recognition is going to come through third party, trusted third party uh, documenters of actual capabilities because of the trust problem. And, you know, the, the tricky thing is we're going to talk, we're going to create a system where workers can move from Niger to France. Like that system is not going to involve the government of Niger certifying anything in France accepting it. Um, and my, so, and again, I think the pensions issue, A, I want to avoid it. And B, the, the real political pensions issue is the rich countries are going to want these workers to pay significant taxes into the pension systems over and above what they're expected to receive. So it's going to be actuarially unfair to these workers. So the real issue is, you know, you're going to, I mean, these workers are going to, I mean, one of the issue, one of the reasons why uh, these massive wage differentials haven't led to a political equilibrium is that unlike in trade of goods, um, nearly all the benefits go to the movers. So both sending and host country, I never like, well, they're not my citizen, they're your citizen. And then the sending country, well, they're not, they've left us, so they're disloyal, some bitches anyway. And so to some extent, what's going to make this equilibrium more likely to happen is everybody's going to take a little bit of a cut off of the wage gains. And we should just say that's going to happen and you're going to be presented a contract of, Here's what you know, you know. Here's what the nominal wage is. Here are the cuts we're going to take, and you're going to fund old Germans. And it's like if you don't want to work in Germany on those terms, we'll find other people. I think that's the real pension issue: is how are they going to collect that um, and make it sound legitimate? Okay. So Harish, I think Harish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think <laughs> I, I want to go back to my book in 2006. Uh, all of these trends were visible for some time, but they have reached a tipping point. Um, that the, 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 they've just been getting more and more severe. And I think now when you see an intrinsically culturally xenophobic country like Japan actively recruiting countries to have mobility agreements, you know, Japan's reached a tipping point in which these labor pressures become so 
big, they can no longer be ignored. Um, B, uh, the, the nativist and right wing stuff, again, in my mind, emerges because you haven't separated these questions. You haven't really said who's going to be legally present to work and who is on path to citizenship. And so what that creates is all kinds of mechanisms of movement because, I mean, after all, the way I put it is migrants, are, any country migrants are in are there because some people in the country really want them. Like it isn't when people say, oh, Americans don't want migrants. That's bullshit. <laughs> employers in America desperately want migrants. <laughs> you know, it's not like Americans are homogeneous. And so, and then that develops disordered mechanisms. It develops illegitimate mechanisms. And the backlash to that, I think, is the nativist politics. But part of the whole political dimension here is how do you disentangle pure kind of xenophobia? I just hate people who aren't my color or my race or my culture or identity from legitimate concerns about order, legitimate concerns about maintaining stability, legitimate concerns about national identity. You can't just call every concern about national be racism and, you know, live in the real world. So, so I, I, I think the nativists have to be cornered <laughs> by saying, Here's an orderly program. Here's a legal program. Here's a legitimate program. Uh, your only reason for objecting to this isn't that it's illegal. Isn't that da, 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 it's you know isn't that they're threatening your culture? Because at the end of their three plus two, they're going to go home. And and I think the Japanese are wonderfully honest in this. We need these workers, but we really want to protect Japanese culture. Some now, the real way to do it was to have made, but they forgot to. Um, I do think. Um, the question about gender and children and the cons are the same question. The biggest issue is family. And I, I think, you know, I think politically countries that are going to engage in core skill rotational mobility are not going to allow that because the FISC just doesn't work. Like you can't bring in a worker that's going to make $23,000 and entitle their three children to $15,000 a year education. So then that raises, I don't, I wouldn't call them ethical concern, but it does raise serious concerns about how you cope with a, un, a divided family. That said, relative to what's happening today, it's terrific because what, particularly in the U.S., without legal pathways, people resort to illegal pathways. And the, when the only enforcement of the border is at the border, then what you do is you encourage your longer stay. So Part of what, you know, really drove me to write a book and get engaged with this issue was visiting a family in South in El Salvador where the woman's daughter, the migrant woman's daughter was being cared for by her sister. She was coming back for the child's quinceañero, 15th birthday, a big transition point. And I asked, well, how long is your mother? When was the last time the mother came back? And it was when the child was two. And for 13 years, that woman had been working in America, which meant... America had no problem with her working there in some sense, or a significant fraction of Americans, but couldn't legally bring itself to acknowledge her presence and her right. So if you had rotational with right to visit, or you know, you built into the contracts, you get to go home once a year, that is a compromise position that's possible if you've made it explicit and thing. But I agree, this is the biggest tension issue of, you know, if you declare there's a universal human right to family reunification, then that the just go, goes up against this. And I think it's like a lot of things, it depends on how long you think it's going to be, right? So again, not allowing family reunification while expecting people to stay 20 years, I think it's morally obscene. You know, I have had visas to work in countries where I wasn't allowed to bring family and I made the choice. Did I want to go? Did I want to go? And I think it's a tough choice, but it's a choice we can allow households to make. And it's going to be the political choice. So, but I think for smaller rotational periods, it's actually better than what happens if you don't have legal pathways, which is it's riskier. You try and take your children at risky ta time because of the lack of unification. You don't have reasonable periods of return and that, you know, tends to disintegration of the household while the migrants gone. 
blah, blah, blah. But it's a huge, hairy issue. And I think if I had to name a con, <laughs> uh, and again, I'm an advocate, so I try to name the con. Um, but <laughs> it's like asking a job interview, what's your biggest weakness? How many minutes? I don't really know. Oh. Well, I worked too hard. And that's right. So I think the biggest downside of this is just how incredibly beneficial it would be. It would make climate change look small. Um, <laughs> uh, and the last thing is, I, so no, just a second, let me answer the last question. Is that like this, this, like, I, again, the whole idea of this is, and it's called labor mobility partnerships. It's, we need to acknowledge multiple actors, and this is never ever going to be, if if it gets handled, sending government or host government, the sending government part's going to get corrupted, for sure. Every government I know that has a monopoly on who can go abroad, it just becomes a source of rents. I mean, in Nepal, it's the most criminalized, politicized industry of all, right? So, so we want, you know, government arms like regulate. And I don't think manpower planning is going to be important as responsiveness. So when they say strawberry farmers or, you know, okay, well, let's set up mechanisms where the private sector can decide, you know, if you have endogenous training and preparation industry, then they can say how much it can cost to train and you can get a training industry responding. So again, I don't think manpower planning is so much the issue as a relationship when the government sees this as an industry there they're creating the possibilities for, but not mandating or, you know, completely controlling. Last word to you. Uh, two thoughts last which came up as you were speaking. Uh, one is the whole issue about family and one of the things that you see in domestic mobility is uh, and it's different. India is different from China in a big way. And what he just mentioned in El Salvador is important. Uh, the nature of East African South. In India, it's mostly the man who is out there. And we have women and the structure of pace. China, it works both ways. Both men and women have moved out. Uh, in Latin America, you, you do see a lot of women. And what's interesting now, they were thinking about the care work story. Uh, from what we see, let's say, in Hong Kong, Singapore, Philippines, but they have a lot more women in that story. And what that does to families, structure, is a is another story. And there's a culture story on the receiving country side, and there's going to be a culture story on the sending country. Uh, so, I mean, I, I wonder if I thought uh, about that in that space. And especially, you know, what, what the Singapore, Hong Kong sort of experience, if, if, if there is something that we can learn uh, about that. The, the, the second thing is, I just realized that your G20 is a very good platform because it's a nice mix of labor exporting and labor importing countries, labor shareplus and labor short term. So if you're going to start with a subgroup, as Rakesh was saying, uh, uh, not not go from bilateral to global, you don't want a media group, it's a, the G20 may not be a bad stock to come yeah. through. It's it's, it's happen. Yeah, it, it, it is an equilibrium. That's an right? I'm saying, yeah, and that's a good point. So, between. and by the way, I think it's before G20 is a talk show. No one really expects concrete accent to emerge from the G20, and we don't need concrete accent from the G20. It's an agenda setting. We want to we want to say. This is an important issue. There's emerging bilateral partnerships. They thinking about how these emerging bilateral partnerships are going to be supported by cooperative international effort. So, you know, nobody's talking about setting up an or you know, I'm not talking about setting setting up a global organization. It this is going to be built from, you know, and and, and you know, part of this is exactly that, you know, and another part of my 2006 book was. A whole chapter devoted to why this isn't going to be the WTO, right? You're never going to get a, no country in the world is going to make multilateral commitments about its border, right? They're not going to say, oh, you know, I mean, that because I we lived through the possibility of WTO mold or being a major mechanism. And I think it failed because the nature of the WTO is multilateral binding commitments. 
that are neutral with respect to nationality. A ton of steel is a ton of steel is a ton of steel. And that's a just not true of people. <laughs> um, you know, a, a Nepali really isn't an Indian in a deep and important way. And, and the second, countries are never going to make, you know, the United States is never going to end an agreement in which Holiday Inn gets to bid for 100,000 workers to come clean hotel rooms and whatever nationality they have to be of the low bidder, Holiday Inn gets higher. Like, just never going to happen, not going to happen in the U.S., not going to happen in France, not going to happen. So we should be expecting that you know, this is going to be worked out country by country, and then we aggregate this into a positive dynamic. So D20 is perfect for that, because it's a talk show. It's an end of the posturing. Glory. Yeah, the vocal for the border. Well, a lot of it weekends. I accept. Do you think you accept? Do you think that that's based on being said? Yeah. He broke a record. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know. It's on being the third world that waves that I will run in Borker. Yeah. But an animal, but yeah, it's not going to be the dirt. You know, where in principle is fair. You have said, you know, you know, we'll have national treatment for domestic and foreign bidders. Bind yourself to, to, and the whole reason why they did your work politically was most favored nation, and nobody's going to do most favored nation migrants. But I think it's just, just on this word, but yes, we have it's a good mid side, and that all most definitely a good sign. Just what they can let, let's maybe maybe what you know, close, and then we can carry on the conversation. Anyone who would go and well, then, uh, I think we've covered, but you know, on a very, uh, Big part about industry making. Um, and then I think there's a real difference. We all know this people and things, but there are also more things that are uh, related between persons and things. Um, there's a lot of interesting work currently being done on temporary possessions. So use a fruct, you know, like use, like how does use right works and how entire industries have been built around, you know, what we used to own, but now we have temporary ownership of for a period of time. So in anthropology, a lot of new work won of temporary possessions, use of craft, gaining rights, huh. you know, the ways in which these are being rethought around things. I wonder whether some of that might be a little bit interesting and generative for us. It's not answering. It's actually very much about like borrowing, like, you know, libraries you know, increasingly don't own things fully. Yeah. The way in which we do them, labor is complicated for us. It's not just over. It's not just over. It's actually it actually goes back to harvesting rights and actually gleaning rights uh, on for, uh, on farms, which were not about over. You know, it's, it's got an older history. It takes you back to 18th, 19th century. Well, sir, on you know, the Japanese GLT, they actually uh, started work on both the social security contribution wide in Japan and the totalization of the river for Continuing your EPF for registration in India, contribute to your pension PD in India. And it is possible, even with the technical return, they be, you know, the wages that they were paying. So, in the case of Japan, you also have another advantage that we end up five years. Provider, which is your employer in Japan, will be happy to relocate you in Toyota Mandible. And so, uh, say, actually, in uh, year 3048 was not such a number. Japanese industry in India signed up and say that since we are producing here based on Japanese models and rights, we are really happy to create an exchange for every those of the rights of we can. And Sweden came forward with a similar minute, but a much smaller number. So by that tree, a lot of these are actually happening fairly quietly. No, no, I, yeah, we buy a claim. That's what happening. And, and, and the point is that I think, you know, what I see is over the next few years, we're creating the minimum viable product. We're demonstrating that it's possible to do these five functions well. It's possible to recruit fairly. It's possible to prepare and have this preparation and training translate into enhanced wave. It's possible to do these things. And then, and when it starts, I think, then it starts. Because we've got to get from, you know, if you're talking about a stock, 
and I am, I'm talking about a stock of 200 million people on a three-year basis, you're talking 70 million people moving back and forth every year, which means these become large, complex, nice industries. Okay. Yeah. No, no, and, and, and this is, uh, but again, thing about the H-1B is it, 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 the higher skill ones so far are relying on the employer and employing the sector to do a lot of the heavy lifting on the regulatory side. And it just doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for the employer because essentially the question is, and your example of Toyota is to some extent, so many rich country firms that are labor intensive are essentially having to backward integrate into the recruitment industry. Like they're having to bring the, you know, it becomes their key operational constraint. So they, whereas that's obviously not the right way to do it. It's right. We did a job concern. Yeah. Should we are an HR and to be concerned. Exactly. So. Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> for inviting me. Well, I've never presented from this end before. When you know, when always 20 year old years. <laughs> <laughs>